Well, welcome to the 7 Under Club. Iran will pay a price for attacking Israel. That's the word from the head of the IDF. The questions are when, where, and how. Well, one of Israel's key concerns is keeping together the coalition that includes the United States and European nations, along with Saudi Arabia and Jordan. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has more. Israel says there's no doubt it will respond to the unprecedented drone and missile attack by Iran. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. We will choose our response accordingly. The question is how and when. Reserve Brigadier General Amir Avivi tells CBN News they presented plans for striking back even before the attack. These plans uh, really can be from, you know, cyber attacks to destroying uh, nuclear uh, plants to completely wiping out uh, the oil production of uh, Iran sinking their navy. There are so many possibilities. Still, the White House continues to press Israel not to take retaliation too far. We don't want to see a war with Iran. We don't want to see a broader regional conflict. We will do what we have to do to defend Israel. We're committed to a ceasefire that will bring the hostages home and preventing conflict from spreading beyond what it already has. Avivi says although Israel can hit Iran in many ways, there's something bigger at stake. One of the considerations is that uh, Israel, of course, would rather see a buildup of a coalition. Israel's successful defense is due to a coalition that included Arab nations like Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Jordanian planes took part in shooting down the massive waves of drones headed for Israel. The Jerusalem Post reports Saudi Arabia acknowledged its part in the coalition. It's also blaming Iran for instigating the October 7th attack by Hamas to thwart normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. The fragile coalition is part of a U.S.-led effort to build a Middle East alliance that recognizes the danger that Shia Iran poses to Sunni Muslim nations and Israel. In an article in the Wall Street Journal, one U.S. official said the Abraham Accords made a significant difference by allowing the countries to work together openly. Israel's defense was strengthened by a coalition of countries led by the United States and working together. Avivi says the coalition, which also included Britain and France, understood they could be next. The U.S. see ballistic missiles flying more than a thousand kilometers in 10 minutes towards Israel, they understand they're next. These ballistic mis missiles can reach Europe, they will reach also the U.S., and in a year or two they can be nuclear. So we need to deal decisively with this threat from Iran and, um, and really uh, build a coalition that will be willing to pose a military threat and deal with these uh, challenges. While the U.S. says it won't take part in a strike on Iran, it's committed to defending Israel. CBN White House correspondent Abigail Robertson reports that Biden is pushing Congress to swiftly pass more foreign aid. The White House called Iran's attack, which caused virtually no damage, a spectacular and embarrassing failure, although it also made clear Iran's intent to cause destruction in Israel. The administration is urging the House to pass the bipartisan national security supplemental that already cleared the Senate so that Israel and Ukraine can continue to defend themselves. Meanwhile, protesters blocked roads and bridges in multiple cities across the U.S., protesting Biden's support for Israel. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, before uh, Israel responds to this Iranian attack, I would encourage them to take care of business in Gaza first. Uh, you need to secure that southern border. Hamas has pledged to repeat October 7 again and again and again. And so in, in response to that pledge, uh, they, they, they shouldn't exist anymore. They shouldn't be the government of Gaza anymore. And it's the same for Iran. It's not the Iranian people. It's the Islamic Republic. Uh, that is what is fueling all of this. And, and they keep, um, you know, standing up Israel as this huge enemy. And I think it's some kind of effort to stay in power. For the past two years, they've been lynching their own people. If, if you protest against the Iranian government and against their policies, they are going to hang you in the public square. 
if you're a woman and you don't wear your headscarf properly, they're going to beat you to death. You, you look at these things, and, and where in the world do you, do, you, do you find anybody that says, I want to support the, their struggle against Israel? But we're seeing it. I mean, these protests in, in our um, own streets, you've got to be kidding me. You're going to stand with that? You're going to stand stand with terrorism you're going to stand with let's attack innocent civilians and and kill them mercilessly why in the world would you ever stand with that kind of action but we're seeing it and it's it's this whole ideology that israel has to be wiped off the map we stand with israel israel has a right to exist and that's been established under international law the rest of the region is willing to, to accept that. I think the Iranian people are willing to accept that and live in peace with Israel. But it's the Islamic Republic, it's this radicalization that has happened, and that is our enemy, and that's what we need to fight. In other news, foreign aid to Israel and Ukraine has been stuck in Congress for months. Well, today, House Speaker Mike Johnson is expected to try to untangle the mess. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. The Senate in February passed a bill combining aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan that was dead on arrival in the House. Johnson's plan will break up the funding into individual bills with support for Israel getting the first vote possibly as soon as this week. The House refused to take up the Senate measure, arguing that the United States should deal with protecting its southern border first. But some Republican members strongly oppose more aid to Ukraine, even vowing to oust Johnson if he agrees to more funding. Speaking on CBS Face the Nation Sunday, GOP Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee Mike McCall said that without Western support, Ukraine risks losing the war to Russia. I talked to the ambassador, our ambassador to Ukraine as well. She said the situation is dire. You know, Kharkiv could implode any day now. That's two million people. Uh, and the power grid is under threat right now. If the power grid goes out in Ukraine altogether, we don't have time on our side here, Margaret. We have to get this done. I would Im implore, what I need to educate my colleagues, they're all tied together. Yes. I mean, Iran is selling this stuff to Russia. Guess who's buying Iran's energy? China. Speaker Johnson says the text of the bills could be released as soon as today. Well, it's a busy day in the House as Speaker Johnson plans to send impeachment articles against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over to the Senate. House Republicans charge Mayorkas is violating the Constitution by refusing to enforce laws to protect the border. The Democrat-led Senate will decide whether to hold a trial. All of this comes as Mayorkas is set to testify in the House on border policies. Illegal border crossing arrests fell last month, partially due to Mexico's increased enforcement efforts. New Border Patrol numbers report more than 137,000 arrests in March. That's down by 3,100 from February. The numbers mark some of the lowest of the Biden administration, which saw a record high of nearly 250,000 arrests back in December. Well, Texas Governor Greg Abbott tells CBN News he won't back down in his legal battle against the Biden administration over his state's attempt at securing the southern border. The fight centers around a new measure allowing state law enforcement agencies to arrest illegal immigrants. CBN chief political analyst David Brody brings us an exclusive interview from Austin, Texas. The saying goes everything is bigger in Texas. Well, that includes the fight over illegal immigration. Enter Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Thanks for inviting us inside the Texas government. Pleasure to have you here. He has a Texas-sized battle on his hands, not just at the border, but in Washington, D.C. Joe Biden has a requirement under the Constitution yeah. uh, to uh, secure our national security. Uh, he's utterly failed at that. And so Abbott has taken matters into his own hands. He's building a wall in a handful of border counties. The state has its own border czar. He's bust illegal immigrants out of Texas and into liberal sanctuary cities. And his Operation Lone Star program has led to a half a million illegal immigrant apprehensions and the seizure of almost 500 million lethal doses of fentanyl. Illegal immigration has gone down in the state of Texas by 72%. Mm -hmm. At that very same time, it has increased in California, Arizona, and New Mexico by 24%. Mm -hmm. So it shows that what we are doing is working. 
But the Biden administration says Texas has overstepped their authority, especially when Abbott installed razor wire in Eagle Pass or floating barriers in the Rio Grande. At the center of the illegal immigration fight here in Texas is a law backed by Governor Abbott giving state law enforcement agencies the power to arrest illegal immigrants. The Biden administration is fighting it, and most likely this will end up at the U.S. Supreme Court. While that works its way through the legal system, the tension mounts between the state of Texas and the feds. I know that this term of civil war, but in other words, skirmishes between the Texas uh, law enforcement and the federal uh, government. Are you concerned about that at the border if Biden gets another term? Let's say I'm resolute about what Texas is doing. How far will Texas go here? Because you can go, you can go pretty far. Well, our goal is to make sure that we defend our border uh, to the point uh, where we are able to completely reduce illegal crossings into the state of Texas. But does that mean going into Mexico? Certain Republicans, like former President Trump and Ron DeSantis, have floated the idea of carrying out attacks on drug cartels inside Mexico. In the case of Governor Abbott, he officially called this an invasion. So according to Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 of the Constitution, that means a state can engage in war if an invasion happens. Have you thought about, is it off the table, that you would go and get rid of these drug cartels, certain ones within Mexico, actually going into Mexico? So I've already declared uh, the, the drug cartels as terrorist organizations, mm -hmm. uh, and that authorizes law enforcement to take uh, extra action against it. Uh, and you can, you can have a war without actually invading a country. The, the, the war uh, would not be against Mexico. The war at this moment is here on the homeland, and one of Abbott's biggest and gravest concerns is those from the Middle East coming over that are on the terror watch list. Some of them are known, many are not. And just as much of a concern to Abbott are Chinese men of military age illegally entering the country. Last year, there were more than 24,000. In the first uh, part of this fiscal year, there's already another 22,000. Right. And, and so uh, th there's basically uh, a Chinese military uh, equivalent uh, in the United States of America. And uh, once again, no one knows what these people are up to. Of course, those aren't the only ones coming over. There are families who are seeking asylum and a better life here in America and are desperate to get away from horrible conditions. Some people will say, well, you need to have compassion. Others will say, well, wait, law and order, making sure there isn't chaos, is compassionate. Well, it, it, chaos obviously is not compassionate. Right. But also what is not compassionate uh, is the federal government of the United States enticing women, children, and others uh, to be uh, sexually assaulted by the drug cartels, mm -hmm. physically abused, sometimes murdered by them, or, or enticing them into a situation where uh, they drown trying to cross the river. There's nothing compassionate about a deadly border. There is something compassionate, however, about order in society. Mm -hmm. And what Texas is trying to achieve is order in our society. In the meantime, Abbott's battle against the federal government rages on. David Brody, CBN News in Austin, Texas. Thanks, David. Gordon? It's incredible we can't defend our own border, that we can't um, uh, actually tell these people that, no, you're not going to be welcome here unless you go through our designated process. You just can't cross a river and suddenly enter into the land of freedom. It, our immigration laws just flat don't work that way. It's taken me a long time to figure out what in the world the administration is up to, what, what's their interest in this. You know, at the start, it was some kind of campaign slogan, what they were going against what Attorney General Sessions did in separating migrant families uh, where children were taken from their parents, which is absolutely horrific, should have never happened. And, and I thought it was some kind of campaign thing. But now, in, in the years following, what in the world are they doing? And if, you're, if, you, if you want to make the argument they're trying to increase the census numbers, because the census doesn't count voters, it counts people. And so if you're trying to say, let's have our urban areas have a greater weight in Congress, uh, it'll be one way to make sure we take control of the Congress. But that's a very long game. That doesn't happen until 2030 when the new census. So it still doesn't make any sense to me. 
Uh, why in the world would you not enforce the laws? And if you want to say for political reasons, well, we're trying to get new immigration reform through Congress and we can't get anything through Congress, enforce the current laws on the books. And I agree with Governor Abbott. There's nothing compassionate about encouraging people to take the horrible journey here. And we've had these reports on this show for, for a couple of years now of what they go through, the number of times that they face death, and only at the very end for women and children to drown in that river because they feel that they're invited to come into the United States. There's nothing compassionate about any of that. Uh, this is a horrible situation. And the administration needs to be held accountable for what they're doing because it's quite evident they're doing it intentionally. Yesterday, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that an Idaho law outlining, outlawing gender-affirming care for minors can go into effect. Well, that's good news for many parents whose children are questioning their gender. In some areas, the church is providing support for these families with ministries that offer resources and other practical help. Paul Petit reports. This is Jonathan West, who is now Jenna. It came from nowhere. Even in Christian homes like Melinda's, gender identity and transitioning is surging. My son was gone, and this person in front of me was going to be changing, and it wasn't the person I knew. Long hair, nails, hormone therapy, all part of Jonathan's transition process. They went in and they took two inches off of each side of his collarbone and they closed those together so that his shoulders would not be so broad. Melinda can't figure out how she missed it. She says Jonathan grew up as a typical boy playing baseball and attending youth group. We really struggled on how to, as Christian parents, address this. Jean and Anita Eggman are helping parents like Melinda. The couple leads a Christian support group at Cross Church in Springdale, Arkansas. Created to guide parents with same-sex attracted children, 40% of the group now includes parents of those who identify as trans. It's basically helping parents navigate through all this, maintaining their faith, and being able to stand on the Word of God, but also show the love of yeah. God to their uh, loved ones. What we have seen, uh, it's very unusual that someone reaches out for a support group right away. A lot of times they just try to uh, work through it by themselves. About Hope is part of the National Hope Restorative Network. Gene and Anita's group meet confidentially every week in this room. Many join online from across the nation, and all of them are given the same tools now helping Melinda deal with her transitioning son. When she first came to us, it Within the first few weeks, we were going through boundaries, creating healthy boundaries. And I remember her saying, I don't think I have any healthy boundaries. I don't have any boundaries. An online resource for parents is called parentsofrogdkids.com. ROGD stands for Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria. I would say that every parent goes through, like, what did I do wrong? You know, um, I certainly did. Started in 2017, the organization now has 3,000 members worldwide. It offers information to also help parents screen therapists who will not simply affirm their child's gender dysphoria. If you go to a gender therapist and they say, I'm confused, and they say, well, you're trans, and, and, and your, your problem is because your parents don't affirm you, okay, well, that's just bad therapy. Melinda's support group has taught her what she's up against and how to navigate her relationship with Jonathan. What we see now is that she, how strong she's gotten. Mm -hmm. And she's... That's awesome. She has learned it's okay to say yeah. no. He won't receive gifts from me because I won't buy him anything pink. In a culture that celebrates the transgender movement, this can be an uphill battle for parents. Through proper support, however, people like Melinda are learning to cope and trust. They can't change them. And so in their Christian faith, they have to fall back on that, that the Lord is the only one that can really change somebody. I am hoping and praying that as he learns who he is, he will learn who he is through Christ. In Arkansas, Paul Petit, CBN News.
Well, all of this gender affirming, if it, it, it affirms a, a question and what should be questioned in therapy, you, you, you wonder what, what's behind that. Why in the world would you affirm somebody going through that kind of radical change if there's any question about it, uh, if, if they're not entirely sure? And you, you, you look at it, is there a profit motive? Are, are they going to be earning more money if they walk through someone through this transition? For children, it, it should be absolutely up to parents what kind of therapy they get, what kind of medical treatment they get. Uh, all of these things should be parents first because children don't understand that life is a long time and decisions you make when you're 12, 13, 14 can last for a very long time. And if you change your mind in your 20s and 30s, you're changing it way too late. Well, for more information on resources available to parents dealing with this issue, all you have to do is go to our website, <coughs> cbnnews.com. Terry? November 2011, Roseanne and Rod Holland's oldest child disappeared, leaving his backpack on the front steps of a church. After years of drug abuse, Mark had become schizophrenic and was wandering the streets like a zombie. Four months later, police discovered his body, and his family was plunged into the depths of unrelenting grief. Why? Why me? Why this? That's my biggest question, is why? Mark was our firstborn. He was a happy, full of wonder little boy. There was a lot of delight in Mark. He loved the world. He fell in love with Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings story. He had a real active, imaginative mind. It just, it changed him. Wonder and imagination just vanished, it seemed like. It just shut him down and shut all the light out of his eyes in a lot of ways. And everything became about that obsession. We take away anything we found that were his sources and we locked the computer as the best we could and we made rules, we made ground rules. And they were broken and over and over and over again. He took on a very, very combative nature, and it was him against the world and him against us. And every step of the way where I had to take a hard stand, I had to close off a portion of my heart. Help me to love him was my biggest prayer. God, I'm having a hard time loving this boy, my own son, I'm having a hard time loving him. God was faithful to remind me he is in my son's life and he loves him more than I ever could imagine. It was hard because over time it felt like we were losing him. We had tried everything and in every case I thought I had hope. So at every step, I thought, well, he surely won't push it to the point where he has to leave the home. But he did. He flunked out of school. He was even stealing from us at some point to get money to buy drugs. I had no question about what I had to do. There was nothing repentant about him. By the time he turned 18, I said, you're going to have to leave. Never ceases to be your son. And that's the hardest part. That's what makes it so hard. It was hurting me but I had to let him live with the consequences of what he chose to do. He was like a zombie. 
and wandering the streets at night and, and stepping out in traffic. And he disappeared. I remember having to go down and look for him and, and not finding him. And how do you how do you deal with that? That's where I felt the lowest. I had no plan. We didn't think he was going to stay or make it, but he did. By God's grace, he stayed. And after a few months, he actually made a strong commitment to the Lord and was baptized. We saw light in his eyes we had not seen in a long, long time. We are so encouraged. He called us a few times, sometimes up. I can do this. Sometimes cry and I'm a loser. I should have never left. But I told him, I said, honey, God is a God of second chances. And you can do this. I love you. We love you. Jesus is with you. Just don't forget that. And he said, I love you, Mom, and he hung up. the question of why didn't you stop him you know you could I know you could you're the God of our hearts right you can call us out of darkness why not I remember our pastor at Mark's memorial service said you may ask the question where was Jesus when Mark took his life when he took those pills, he said, I would suggest to you that he was there. And he caught him when he fell. It took him home to be with him. We were all together as a family to receive that call. And it allowed us to grieve together as a family. The kids, they could see us grieve together about it and grieve in faith and grieve in trusting God. Each in their own way came to faith and that they'll see him again, they'll see Mark again. I know that God loved him all the way up to the end. I know that I can trust him with my children and I know that what he does is right and good. What went through my mind was, really, God? I don't understand why. What he's shown me is that when he takes away, he gives something better in return. Because he's given me himself in the, all the losses that I've gone through, I have sought him and I found him. As I learned to thank God every day for the little things and for the things that I had left, it gave me joy. I began to understand what James meant when he said, count it all joy, brothers, when you go through trials of many kinds. How can you otherwise recognize God's goodness in every part of your life? I thank God that 
Even though I've lost part of my hearing, I can still hear birdsong. And I thank God that I can still look through my camera and see his beauty. I have a husband who loves me and cares for me. I have three beautiful children and now two grandsons and another on the way. I have a church body that came around us during the time of Mark's death that just blew us away with their love. How can I not be grateful? I find that I fall in love with the pottery when I make it. I can put my thumb in it and it shows. I can put a stamp in it, it shows that pattern. And then I cut it off the wheel and I set it aside and it dries. And it's not soft and pliable anymore. And it's hard and it's kind of lifeless. And then when it comes through the final firing, it's just like, wow, it takes on a whole new life. There's almost a pathway of death and rebirth in that whole process that I think is reflected in what we've come through in a lot of ways. What each one of us goes through as God brings us through death really into new life in, in Him, and it's His work, and He brings you forth into something that really, really glorifies Him. I love capturing light. I love the way God has created light and the way it filters through things, the way it changes colors, and the way the landscape changes. I get up in the mornings and I look out and the first thing I see is a sunrise. It's just a constant reminder of His faithfulness. Every day the sun rises, He's there every day. He's with me. He never fails, never, ever fails. He's also with us in the darkness before the sun rises. This family has been such a visual of how to walk through hard places, how to walk through very hard places. Grief is almost palpable when you've lost somebody and it seems unfair, it seems tragic. You know, there's, there's death when it comes in the time frame that we all expect it to and then there are the unexpected losses along the way. God's okay with your asking why. He can manage that. Here's the thing, this family had faith. So even before Mark's death, when they were walking through all of the difficulties, all of the challenges, trying to be enough, trying to make things change, trying to impact Mark's life, they had God. Because he's always with us, never leaves us or forsakes us, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But friends, when you go through these things, if you don't know the Word of God and you don't know the promises of God, where are you going with that? In those dark places, when you're asking the whys, those are the places where your relationship with God comes into play, where you can pray as was written, and that though he slays me, yet will I praise him because you know him well enough to trust him in the hard times. It's not trust in the good times. Everybody likes the good times. Where are you in the darkness? Where are you in the hard times? We get to choose. And what I love about Roseanne's story is that she then three years later went on with some of the physical things that she went through. She got to choose. You know, she could have sat in the middle of all of that and she could have made a laundry list of all the things that were happening to her and her feelings about all of those things and what it was that, that was the loss involved in it. Instead, she chose to make a laundry list of all the blessings that were a part of her life. It makes a difference. How we choose makes a difference. And that gift of being able to choose is what differentiates us from all of the rest of God's creation. We get to say 
what we will do. We get to choose what we'll think. You know, today I just want to say to you, you may be in a dark place. You may be in a place with lots of whys in your life. Choose to trust God. Choose to be with him and let him be present with you in your moment. He's there. He was with Mark in that covered slide. He was with Roseanne as she walked through all of the things that she was going through physically, and he is with you right now. Talk to him. Pray. Just invite him right into the midst of your circumstance, your loss, your need. He's waiting, and he's there, and he can manage your why. If you're struggling with grief in your life, maybe you've lost someone or gone through a situation that you can't quite seem to come out from under, we have a resource for you called Overcoming Grief. It's filled with wonderful information from the Word of God. We would love to send it to you. It's absolutely free. Just call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I'd like that resource on grief, and we will send it out to you right away. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. The FBI reportedly is launching a criminal investigation into the cargo ship that slammed into Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge, causing a deadly collapse last month. Agents boarded the Dolly International, International ship with search warrants Monday. They're focusing on what happened in the moments before, during, and after impact. Investigators want to find out if the crew knew whether the ship had potential mechanical issues that made it dangerous to sail in the harbor. So far, divers have recovered four bodies from the wreckage. Two remaining victims are still missing underwater. Well, a three-part docudrama series about Moses has landed among Netflix's top ten most popular series. It's called Testament, the Story of Moses, and it debuted on the streaming platform back in March as the number one show. The series shows Moses' remarkable life as a prince and prophet with insights from theologians and historians, and it deals with his human side as well, including showing his flaws and what he had to overcome in life. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Well, year after year, Alexa didn't grow or gain weight. Her heart was always beating too fast, and she was always tired. Well, then one day, the doctor said she urgently needed surgery or she would die. For most parents, a child's birthday is filled with hope for the future, but not for Alexa. She'd been born with a hole in her heart. She went to the cardiologist every year around her birthday. At first, they said the hole could close on its own with treatment. So I spent years going to the doctor, worrying about what he would say. And every time he said the hole had gotten bigger. And every year, Alexa's health got worse. She did not improve. She did not grow or gain weight despite what we fed her. And even with the heart medicine, her heart was always beating too fast. And she was tired all the time. Meanwhile, Alexa's condition was taking a toll on the whole family, including her dad, Carlos. The doctor said if Alexa was not operated on, she would possibly die. I didn't want to hear that news. Both Jacqueline and Carlos worked hard to save for their daughter's surgery. Carlos knew there would never be enough. It's impossible with the salaries we have. Even if we join my brother's salary or the whole family income, there will never be enough to pay for this surgery without help. Then they received the news they'd been praying for. Operation Blessing paid for Alexa to receive open-heart surgery at the only heart hospital in El Salvador. It was very emotional for us because we saw that this was a miracle for our daughter. Alexa soon returned home and according to her mom, she's been healthy ever since. It has changed her life. Now, she goes to school like a normal girl. She plays, and her heart is normal. I will be forever grateful to the people who made this surgery possible. We thank God and Operation Blessing for helping us. 700 Club Partners, that's you in action. You're changing lives. You're doing it all the time and all around the world. 
all because you care enough to give. If you want to be a part of it, a part of everything we're doing around the world, a portion of every gift you give to the 700 Club goes into the work of Operation Blessing. Another portion goes into the work of CBN International to preach the gospel around the world. You're part of all of it when you join with us. If that's you, call right now, 1-800-700-7000, and say, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? Well, it's $20 a month. Some can join at higher levels. We have them. 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club, that's $1,000 a year. That's $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call and join, I want you to have it. It's a teaching of my life and, and learning how to heal the sick. What are the biblical principles for how to believe for healing, how to pray for healing, how, how to uh, have God's miracle power th flow through you? I want you to have it. It's yours when you join, so call us, 1-800-700-7000. And listen, let me tell you about some people who've already received the healing teaching and the book workbook that goes with it. Martha and Greg are from Salem, Oregon. We really enjoyed watching How to Believe for Healing and the God Does Miracles. My husband and I are studying the workbook together and learning so much and enjoying it. Thank you. And then April, who lives in Bentonville, Arkansas, says, I really enjoyed studying in the workbook. It's such a tremendous blessing. It encouraged my heart and strength stirred up my faith to keep on asking and be persistent with my prayers and requests. People are loving it. Amen. Yeah. Right. Great opportunity. Get yours. Join now. A hungry heart, a positive attitude, and a good work ethic. That's what managers at Chick-fil-A first notice about Peyton Edwards. Eight years later, she's a Chick-fil-A manager herself and the recipient of the True Inspiration Scholarship. Peyton Edwards never saw it coming. So I was told that I was just getting interviewed for like a campaign that we're doing here. So when I walked out and I saw the camera, I was like, okay, cool. This March, the 24-year-old Regents student was one of 14 Chick-fil-A employees across North America to receive the True Inspiration Scholarship. CEO Andrew Cathy presented Peyton with a $25,000 check and a new laptop. She has such a positive um, attitude about the future and wants to have an impact on the lives of other people. Peyton started working full time at the Virginia Beach location when she was 16. When she first came to us, she had a hungry heart to really serve and to work hard. It's a good, good work ethic. And then we just built upon that. We gradually just kind of kept investing in her, trusting her more with the business, giving her more responsibility. We caught up with Peyton a few weeks after the event. She was still taking it in. I was, yeah, very surprised, very shocked, very grateful. The scholarship was great. And then I saw the laptop and I was like, that's even cooler. Peyton now holds a management position, but she says it's more than a job. I'm just super passionate about the company and the values that they hold. So when it came time to pick a school to earn her bachelor's degree, she chose Regent University. Everything that I looked at, really just aligned with my goals for the future, like my faith, all signs pointed to region. I really just feel like that's what the Lord was calling me to. In the fall of 2021, Peyton enrolled in Regent School of Business. As predicted, it wasn't easy. I thought that it was pretty impossible. Like I've heard people talk about working full time and going to school, but I've heard the stories of like how stressful it is and how time management is so important. I realized that it was more like, tangible than I thought. She says her professors have been a great help in her journey in more ways than one. At Regent, it's different. It's like, how can I pray for you? How can I give you resources? Payton plans on staying with Chick-fil-A after she graduates in 2026 with a degree in business management. She says Regent continues to play a large role in her success. I'm able to apply the principles that I've learned with good leadership at my job. I think Regent has done an excellent job of just instilling that. Well, just imagine a university in today's world where the professors ask you, how can I pray for you? If you want to go to Regent University, here's where you, what you have to do. You can call us, 1-866-910-7615. There's a special number there. And you say, I, I want to find out more about how I can apply. What are the various programs that you have? You can also go to our website, regent.edu, and you can find out more. Uh, we believe in Christian leadership to change the world. And if you're called into that, we want to see you trained so you can be the best at what you do. 
So, regent.edu. We've got some time for some questions now. This first one is from Ayudija. By God's grace, I'm a Christian, and sometimes I enjoy talking to God. However, upon reading the scriptures, I discovered I was doing it wrong. We ask God for what we want, shout out loud, and mostly repeat the same things. So my question is, how do we pray acceptably, and how long do we do it? Well, you've got the first key right there, that you enjoy talking with God. Prayer should be a conversation, and, and in conversations, it's sometimes important to be quiet <laughs> so you can listen uh, to what the other person is saying. Uh, God has a personality. He wants to talk with his children. He wants to open your ears so that you can hear his voice, and you can see how he's working all things together for your good. But in terms of prayer and, and specific requests and, and, and that is a, a, a consistent theme throughout the Bible. I brought my request before the Lord. The words of the Apostle John should govern every prayer. If we pray in accordance with his will, then we know that he hears us. And if he hears us, we know we have what we request. So do you know God's will? Do you know what he wants to do on the earth? Does he, do you know what he wants to do in your life? And are you praying for that to become tangible, for that to become real? Are you praying in accordance with his will? If you're praying, you know, Lord, I want the mega yacht or that kinds of things, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he, that's not his will for you. So it, it's, it's, you have to first identify that. Uh, I encourage Christians to, number one, study the prayer, the Lord's prayer, how he he instructed his disciples to pray. Then, then look at the prayers of the Apostle Paul. They're full of uh, wonderful inspiration and wonderful pathways uh, for prayer. And then one of the great revelations I had, it was about 30 years ago, where I realized that every psalm was also a prayer. It was a conversation. It was a conversation in song, but it was a conversation with God. And, uh, you know, you can spend a whole year just on Psalm 119. Uh, so uh, what are the, what's the great Hallel? Uh, what are the great prayers of David, uh, the Psalms of Moses, Solomon, uh, the sons of Korah, the grandsons of uh, the prophet Samuel? All of these are written down, and they're pathways for you. And if you follow these pathways, you have every confidence you're going into the throne room of God and you're praying in accordance with His will. When you do that, you know you're going to get an answer. Well, here's a word from one of the Psalms. I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. May you have that perfect peace today. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.